Lucky Meetup Group. Um, so we've got a really great uh, show lined up for you tonight. I call it, call it a show, because <laughs> that's what it's turned out to be. Honestly, this was supposed to be a small little gathering, but um, there was so much interest, and you guys are awesome. So we were like, let's let everybody in. And let's make All right, here we go. So uh, first up, we're going to have for you Alan Furstenberg. He is a Google Glass developer expert, and as far as I know, he's the only one. So and we're lucky to have him. Uh, he's the first and only, and uh, recognized by Google. So, um, so that uh, he's going to talk to us about thinking for Glass and how to design for Glass. Uh, next up is going to be Zach Fr uh, Friedman. You guys know Zach, right? He uh, was one of our presenters last time. He's come up with some really cool work with a Nerf blaster, and he's going to share with you guys uh, a little bit on how you can make that happen for yourself. And uh, I don't even oh, it works. <coughs> Cool. Hey guys, so um, thank you so much for coming. How many developers do we have here tonight for Android? Couple? iOS? Windows Phone? <laughs> we're really excited to have you tonight, uh, especially with the rain and everything. Uh, we're just getting started. I mean, this is early days in Glass. Uh, it's not even available to the public yet. There's no consumer edition. We're Explorers, Explorer Edition, United. Uh, unlimited possibilities. Let's just keep doing what we are excited about. Um, so yeah, Katy, uh, you still have some more slides. <laughs> I'm gonna go over this. I will be back in a minute. <laughs> All right, guys. So, cool. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, my name is Katy, and I have been a Glass Explorer since last year in June. I'm an OG. Um, <laughs> I was part of the If I Had Glass contest, and uh, basically part of the community from the beginning when we were just doing hangouts online and we didn't really know anybody else with Glass. And over time, we started meeting in person, and as our group grew, uh, we've become what you see here today, just over 600 or so members. And um, so, so basically, uh, My startup is called Exocracy. Um, Exocracy is a social media platform for voting on political and social issues. And we actually have a Glass app uh, that we're testing out and it was developed through this community. Uh, through one of the Hangouts, uh, I talked about Glass. Uh, I talked about Exocracy and Glass and uh, a friend, Timothy Clemens, whom I've actually never met, uh, developed one for us. So that's what I'm trying to say is the great thing about this community is the connections that you can make. And that's what I love most about being up here. People ask me why I do this, and I really do this because of you guys, because it's, it's awesome. You guys are the coolest people I have literally ever met. The most innovative and forward-looking people are the ones that are interested in embracing this new technology. So, so I applaud you guys for, uh, for coming out and being a part of this community. I um, want to tell you about one of our uh, events that I'm working on. I'm really into sustainability. Anybody here into sustainability? Yeah. I really believe among a few subjects that sustain sustainable tech is going to be a big way in the future. So anyway, what we're doing is organizing a tour of Brighton Green Properties, which is in Brooklyn, New York. And it's uh, sustainably built to pass international passive house standards. So if you go to greentechnyc.co, you can join us when we do this tour. So picking up where I left off, how many explorers do we have here tonight? Raise your hand, because I can't see every glass in the room. Wow. OK, how many people want glass? Don't have it yet. OK. All right, good to know. So uh, this is uh, a little bit about me. I'm Circo, founder of NYC Apps. That's my Twitter handle. That's my Google Plus for people that use Google Plus. We love Google Plus here at Google Glass NYC. We have an event coming up uh, next week. Hope to see you there. This is what I do uh, during the day, um, MakerBot. We're really excited about the momentum we've been building the past five years now. We just celebrated our five year anniversary. Anyone heard of MakerBot? Okay. 3D printing, scanning, great software. We're an innovation company. Um, so a little bit more about Glass. Wearable computing devices will replace tablet-based computing. For many clinicians, 
who need their hands free and instant access to information, Dr. John Halamka, CIO of Beth Israel Deacons Medical Center. This isn't just words, this is honestly months of use. This is months of real everyday use on patients, testing on animals, whatever it may be. People are really using glass in the hospitals. Um, who's excited about this? I mean, come on. <laughs> Spending more time with your doctor, not waiting for him to fumble with his tablet to uh, go, go meet with a nurse uh, to double check something. He has it all right there on his face, either a hand gesture or his voice, instant access, always up to date. Really exciting. We're really excited to see where this is going to go in the healthcare industry. Uh, just the tip of the iceberg, basically. Again, tonight, we're so excited to have Alan Prisoner, Furstenberg, Google Glass developer expert, uh, officially recognized as, from Google as one of the leading developers uh, for Glass. Zach Friedman, professional hardware hacker. Zach might look familiar to you guys if you've been to our, our event last time. He is, yeah, one to watch. Definitely, we're excited to have both of these presenters tonight. And we're excited to have you experience that and uh, create a dialogue and let's, let's get things going. Woo! Thank you guys. Uh, two things before we get started. Uh, first is uh, in the media meetup group. If I can ask everybody to make sure you've got your full name in there, it really causes a lot of trouble when it's just like oh, you know, if, if your name is like John and you've signed up with John, it's hard to get you a security badge downstairs. And Google gives you know uh, is pretty pretty strict about security here. So we really need you guys when you RSVP to the events to make sure we have your full name. Otherwise, we can't let you in, and it, it causes problems for everybody all around. So uh, when you guys leave here today, or if you can check on your phone real quick, make sure you've got your full name set up with the meetup. <coughs> that would be awesome. Second thing is, I see a lot of ladies here with Google Glass on. I'm loving this. Raise your hand if you're a lady with glass. Come on, ladies. All right. All right, I like that because that's one, one problem we have in tech, as you know, is there aren't enough women in tech. And I've been in tech for uh, something like 15 years or so with uh, I originally studied computer science, so I'm always I'm always happy to see more women uh, support in tech, especially Google Glass. So I applaud you guys. Are you guys ready to get started? Yep. All right, let's do this, Alan. Thanks, everyone. Everyone hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. All good. Yep. Good. So, uh, so my presentation tonight is about thinking for glass. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a look at the right ways to think about designing your glassware. And I bring this up because what we see a lot as people start to build their glassware is the first thing they do is they pull up the sample code, they compile it, they run it, or they try to get the GDK working, and they create this, this app that works for some definition of works in the sense that it runs and doesn't crash too often. <laughs> but when you actually try to use it on glass, you find it incredibly cumbersome. It doesn't feel like you should be. It feels like you should be using it on a tablet, which is probably what it was designed for. So let me tell you a little bit about myself first. My name's Alan Furstenberg, and I'm a software developer. Uh, I'm a glass explorer. I signed up at Google I.O. 2012, literally as I was walking out the door. Um, I was a few feet away from the, parach the, uh, the parachutist who came running down the hall. That was thrilling, but what was more thrilling to me than the first person camera was seeing what they were, what they were showing about how they were interacting with glass. How glass was this technology that was always there, you didn't have to worry about it, when you needed it, you used it, and the rest of the time you were interacting with the rest of the world. So that immediately grabbed me. I signed up. I took part in the Foundry event. And that's where I, I first got my exposure to actually using Glass and programming for it. And I was hooked. To me, this was a radical new concept that I didn't have to hide behind my technology in order to use the technology. I could be part of the world around me. And the technology would come to me when I needed it. So I did a lot of developing did a lot of helping other developers make their stuff, learn how to use glass, learn how to create really good glassware. Uh, for that, I became the, I was recognized as the Google developer expert for glass. 
That means that I don't work for Google, um, but it does mean that, that Google acknowledges that I know a little bit about developing glassware. They also recognize that I'm one of those people who wants to help others develop glassware. And that's been a, a big part of why I do presentations like this, why you'll see me out in the community, why you'll see me on Stack Overflow. <coughs> because I want great glassware out there. And I think together we can all build some great glassware. How many of you have developed for glass already? I see a small smattering. How many of you want to? I see a lot more hands, and that's wonderful to see. So what I hope you get out of this presentation is an understanding of what it takes to develop great glassware. Um, as part of that, I'm writing a book. I've got a book coming out in a few months from O'Reilly titled Thinking, Think for Glass, Discover, Design, and Develop. Kind of get an idea where I thinking comes from on all of this. Uh, and finally, I'm, I told you I'm a developer. I've got some glassware that's out in the My Glass market right now. Really, I don't need a phone call right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Glass, cancel phone call. <laughs> um, it actually is my editor. <laughs> You're giving it away for free. Um, I have glassware that's out in my glass right now called Voodoo. You can take a look at it in my glass, or you can uh, visit us at voodoo-list.com. Finally, everything, all of my slides, uh, links to Stack Overflow, links to all my presentations, links to me on Google+, links to me on Twitter, links to me everywhere are through prisoner.com. So anything you want to know about me, that's where you can go and find me. So what does it mean to think for glass? And the biggest reason why I always like to talk about design before I talk about writing a single line of code for glass is coding is easy. How many of you are, are coders? Okay, so all of us. How many of you coders like to actually design before you write a line of code? You're lying. <laughs> and I know you're lying because I don't either. You're either lying about designing or Right. Um, but it's essential when it comes to glass. And the reason why it's essential when it comes to glass is glass is different than anything we've dealt with before. Those of you who have used glass, and I see it's a good number of you, those of you who wear it on a regular basis realize just how different it is. Glass itself does very little that has never been done before. What it does, however, is it does it in a completely different way. The form factor is critical to glass. And people who have never worn glass don't understand that. Those of us who have worn it, it might take a while to realize this, but once we do, we begin to realize there's something different about glass. And because there's something different, we can't just throw the same old code, throw the app on the screen, it just works. Well, it'll work, but again, it'll work like garbage. So coding is easy, designing for glass, that's hard. How many of you who are coders have seen these five principles before? That is bad, people. How many of you have actually visited the, 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 the glass web pages at developers.google.com slash glass? Okay, write that down. And I didn't put it on the slide because I actually thought that most of you would have started there. That is where you start developers.google.com slash glass. I only see one person writing it down and only one person recording it on their glass. I'm serious about this. You want to start there. And the reason why you want to start there is because Google has actually done a lot of work to give you the information you need about designing and developing for glass. And it's all right there. That's the place to start. What they've done is they've given these five principles for designing for glass. These are guidelines that will help you, as a developer, understand the right way to approach designing your glassware. So the first, and I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, um, partly because I don't have a lot of time tonight, and partly because I expected you to all know this. Um, but the first is, this may seem obvious, but when you're designing for glass, you actually need to design for glass. <laughs> and and we all laugh at that, but it kind of underlines the point that you need to start by thinking about this differently. You need to start by realizing that what you've got is not a tablet strapped to the side of your head. You've got something that's unique and different. People will treat it differently. 
So let me ask you something. For, for those of you who use glass, how often, when, when you do use glass, how often do you stare at it for more than 30 minutes at a time? Nobody, good. How about for more than 10 minutes at a time? I see, what, I see one hand back there. Um, I'd like to check your vision sometime later. <laughs> How about five minutes at a time? One minute, a couple more hands, a lot of ifs. 30 seconds, five seconds, less than five seconds. Okay. <laughs> so that kind of gives you an idea. When you're looking at glass, I usually like to tell people, think about the fact that most people are going to look at glass for less than five seconds at a time and usually much less than five seconds. We call these micro-interactions. And whenever you're everything you're designing for glass should at least go in with the concept that people, at least initially, are going to look at what shows up on the screen in a fraction of a second. It's a glanceable interface. You may be hearing a lot about glanceable interfaces because, shockingly enough, Google released, announced another product yesterday <laughs> that's all about glanceable interfaces. So everything I'm teaching you now will apply elsewhere. The second base concept is don't get in the way. We have to remember, glass is meant to be there when you want it and out of the way when you don't. So right now, I'm talking to all of you, and if a phone call came in, hypothetically speaking. <laughs> um, I want to be able to glance at it and ignore it. You have to remember that the person who is using your glassware is not going to be staring at the screen. They're going to be staring at the world around them. So your glassware needs to keep that in mind. And you need to adapt to it. It takes a different way of thinking. But you need to keep that in mind. The next is you need to make sure you keep it relevant. It's fine to, tend to send a person an announcement of what's going on around them, telling them what the current traffic is nearby if you're expecting them to be traveling home soon, telling them about subway delays if they're in the vicinity of a subway. It doesn't make much sense to send them information that's completely irrelevant to them. One of the things I like to say that you need to do as you're designing glassware, you need to read the mind of the person wearing glass. That's a big trick. Um, and yet Google does it. That's what Google Now is all about, is reading the mind of the person who is using Google Now at that very moment, anticipating what they will expect to see next, and delivering that. Your glassware needs to do that as well. In line with that, you have to avoid the unexpected. Or when you are delivering something that is unexpected, it needs to be a pleasant surprise. <laughs> We, you laugh at this, and yet that's what people expect, I guess, if you, you think about that. Um, they're expecting things to be delivered to them at class, but the things that they're expecting, they want to be what they want. It wants to be something good. So for example, you don't want an alarm going off at 3 a.m. telling you about an early bird special sale down at the local supermarket. That's unexpected, and it's unpleasant. On the other hand, if you're walking into a store, you might want to notice at that moment that there is something on sale at the back of the store. That is also unexpected, but that's a pleasant surprise. So when you're thinking of delivering these pleasant surprises, make them pleasant. Or give people a way to schedule when they get your notices, so at least they're expecting it on some level. And finally, you need to remember you're building for people. And again, this almost seems obvious. It seems intuitive. Well, we're always building software for people, right? No, we're not. Most of the software that we've been building over the past several decades have required people to adapt to what we have built. So when we built mainframe computers, we expected people to learn how to use a punch card. When we built PCs, we expected them to learn these arcane keyboard combinations. When we moved to the Mac, we expected them to understand these funny symbols that were showing up on the screen. When we moved to a tablet, we expected them to learn this new keyboard layout. When we moved to a phone, we had the same thing. We've seen over and over that we've designed software to make it as pleasant and as easy 
for people to learn how to use it. But always we've made it so that people have to learn what we're doing. Your glassware should try as much as possible to do exactly the opposite. It is important for you to remember, glass is meant for people to live in their world. Your glassware must live in their world. You are not inviting them into your world. That's a radical change, and it's one that a lot of people have trouble adapting to. So I've covered these five things. Does anybody have any questions on this right now? Yeah? What if you're trying to offer somebody a view of their world they might not have known they want? OK, so, so you're trying to say, does glass do augmented reality, and how can we get glass to do augmented reality? <coughs> the answer is um, you still have to, to deal. You still have to understand and deal with these things. So you still have to accept the fact that what you're delivering to them can't be unexpected. They need to be anticipating these sorts of things. Um, you don't want to get in the way. One of the reasons why glass is really good, in my opinion, why it, it sits in your peripheral vision instead of in the center of your vision, is that they can choose to ignore that if they wish. It's easy for them to pay attention to what's around them, and you're giving these subtle cues to them along the way. That's an appropriate place for your software to augment the world around them. You never want to be invasive. Yes, Zach? It's a good one, I promise. I'm sure it will be. What, what, if, uh, what if the app is more uh, designed for action? The user has specifically said, I want to go deep with something. I want to do some heavy duty functionality. You think, uh, how do you how do you balance that? How do you balance that need to every once in a while, like just kind of strap on and force the person to? Uh, you know, I don't know that question. Well, <laughs> when, when can these rules be compromised? The answer is actually always. You're always compromising design guidelines. But I think when you break a rule, you need to be breaking it once you understand the rule, and you don't just say, "Well, you know, it's more important for me to deliver that advertising to them." at 3 o'clock in the morning than it is for them to sleep. You need to understand why you're going to break a rule and what they're expecting from you. So yes, if you create an immersive application, you are on some level anticipating that they want that immersive application. One of the things we've seen, though, as more and more glassware comes out, as more and more people try these things, is that very quickly, they get tired of that immersive application with glass. To, to give one quick example, um, we might remember Frogger was one of the first games for Google Glass out there, released a number of months back. Everyone was really excited about it. Everyone was nodding their heads or jumping around playing this game for a couple of days, and it disappeared. And the reason why it disappeared is because it kept people into it for far too long at a time, and that was uncomfortable. That was unpleasant to use on Glass. It might be a very pleasant experience on a tablet, and that's where it should remain. Glass is not going to be the only device people will use. And you have to accept that fact, that your apps, where, where possible, will want to work with other environments. You're not going to try to configure menu items on, on Glass, for example. It's uncomfortable. It's a pain. You're much, going, you're much rather want to have a separate web page or application where they set those menu items that applies to Glass. Anything else on this before I move on? Yeah? Take away the camera, what is the advantage of designing for glass as opposed to the wearable type of watch or smartwatch? That's actually a really good question for obvious reasons. Um, and the obvious reasons Repeat being. The question, it, the, sorry, the, the question basically boiled down to why is glass vastly superior to a Moto 360? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that does summarize your question, right? Right, to a degree. But uh, <laughs> until glass becomes less socially. That's actually a really good question. And again, like I said, it, it boils down to why is glass vastly superior to a Moto 360? <laughs> Injecting my, my opinion in here. Um, yes, the camera is part of it. And part of the reason why the camera is part of it, in my mind, is that it goes to the heart of 
glass wants to get you back to the world around you. It wants you to stay in the world around you as much as possible. So even with a, um, even if they put a camera on the Moto 360C, um, you're, you're still got this issue of aiming it and, and manipulating it. You're manipulating a wrist, which is a little more uncomfortable. With glass, you're pointing, you're shooting, you're getting on with your life. Um, I noticed today, for example, that, that Google Voice commands or Google Voice search now allows you to say, okay, Google, take a picture. Does that sound familiar to anyone who uses glass? Yeah. Um, and while it works, it's slow. Glass tries to deliver quickly, tries to be there and then not be there. And that goes to the heart, you know, so if you take away the camera from glass, what do you have? Yes, you still have glanceable. You still have this, this presence in the moment. And I think the fact that it's on your face makes it faster and easier for you to stay involved in what you're doing, do something, and get back to, to the world around you. And I think that's a little bit easier than going like this all the time. Um, I think time will tell. I certainly think there are applications where a watch is a really good application. I think we're going to see the two of them developing some things in parallel. We've already seen them developing some things in parallel. But I think using, having it on your head leaves you in the world around you much better than, than the watch does. I, I don't want to dwell too much more on this, but yeah. Um, a question. What do you think about um, Dr. Stephen Hawking can benefit from using the Google Glass? Stephen Yeah. Um, Personally, my, my understanding about uh, Dr. Hawking's condition is that it wouldn't be very useful for him, mostly because he already has extremely limited um, control over anything at this point. And his, if, if he had started to develop his symptoms now, yes, I think glass might be a good way to, 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 to assist him. I think at this point, his technology that he's using now is far more tailored to his needs. But it does raise the question, what are, when we're talking about spe uh, specific applications, yes, some of this is going to, to go out the window. Um, but again, it doesn't mean that you should throw it all out the window without understanding why. These rules, I think, apply for the most general cases for most of the software that we'll be developing for Glass. I saw one more question over here. Uh, yeah, but not. Okay. In that case, what, what I'd like to do now is present three different scenarios fairly quickly. Um, and I want to kind of discuss with you and get some of your ideas about the best way that we can apply these five principles to this scenario. So we're going to do a little bit of designing for glass right now. And start warning me if I'm getting short on time. I have about five minutes. Okay. Um, so here's a quick one. We, uh, we know that Glass has a GPS system in it. How many, of you use, how many of you use that GPS system? A few of you. Good. I don't. And the reason why I don't is that most of the time, I know where I'm going. And it turns out, a lot of times, people know where they're going when they use a GPS system. They're using the GPS to tell them how far they are from their destination, and when are they going to get there, and is there any traffic? Now, for that, I end up using my phone. How many of you have used the, the new Google Maps to do navigation? How quickly does your battery die? Yeah. Um, I know that even if I have it plugged in, the GPS drains the battery faster than it can recharge. So in my mind, since all I really want is how long is it going to take me to get there, I want a better way. What can we do with glass today? to give us that kind of better performance. We get the better battery usage, we need to know when we're gonna get there, and we're gonna to need to know is there any traffic along the way with these five concepts. Any thoughts? Anybody? Zach? Me? Yeah, you. <laughs> Plug your glass into a battery pack. Plug your glass into a battery pack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Use your voice to ask the question. Use your voice to ask the question. That's good, and that's a good start, but does that mean, am I going to start sounding like my kids in the back? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Time, time to get there. 
Who said that? Okay. How often would you want that delivered to you? Every half hour. Every half hour. Okay, that's not bad. I usually think about every 10 minutes, I start wondering if I'm, if I'm going to be late. If I check every whatever, five minutes, what is that? If there's a change, you want to notify it. Exactly. You guys are narrowing in on it. Basically, you want Glass to act as a notification system to you, let you know every five minutes, every 10 minutes, every half hour, what your time to target is, or if something has changed, let you know immediately. So again, it helps you avoid the unexpected. It keeps it relevant. It's always updating that time for you, but it's designing for class. It's not interrupting you. It's built for you, because you're the one doing the driving. You can't take your hands off the wheel. It'll send you that information as you go. Let's take this one. How about we design a system for glass that helps you navigate around a museum? And when I say museum, I don't necessarily mean an art museum. We've got some great applications for that one. Okay, so we need to know things like, what's interesting? Can you direct me for something that's interesting? What is right in front of me? What is off to my left? And if it's really important, let me take a snapshot of it so I can see it later. And I'm going to do a little bit of a cheat on this one. I'm going to assume that we've got some technology that we know is coming out eventually. Any thoughts on this one? I don't hear any. iBeacon. What was that? iBeacon. iBeacon, very good. Oh, Bluetooth. Bluetooth Low Energy. Yeah. What does Bluetooth Low Energy give us? Uh, low location, but within a very small distance. Very small distance location. <laughs> Excellent. OK, what else do we have on glass? We've got a you got, you got to register using the camera. There's no other way to do it. No other way to do what? Figure out what you're looking at. Figure out, you know, BLE and whatnot only localize, doesn't localize your direction. No, but what else on Glass does localize your direction? Uh, compass. Don't say compass. <laughs> ah, yes. Compass does have issues. But like I said, let's assume some tech pending technology that actually works. Boom. Yeah, there, there, there are things that help you navigate through buildings. And this is kind of where I'm going with this one, is... Okay, so you're also thinking social activity with this. Or scout. Sure. So, so again, and I'm not trying to go into code here. What I'm trying to look at is design. Okay, so again, we've got a design that's for glass. It doesn't make you pull out other devices. It doesn't get in your way. You can be wandering around the museum and you'll be getting little notifications and it's only when you care about those notifications that you can pay attention to them. It's relevant, it's based on location, it's based on direction that you're facing. You're avoiding the unexpected, but more importantly, when you do get a notification, it is a pleasant surprise. You're discovering things in the museum you didn't know before and you're building it for a person. You're not asking them to stop and stare at something and tell them what it is. You're telling them what it is proactively. Alan, are you suggesting making tombstones that have PLE transmitting the information about the picture? No. Right no. What I'm, what I'm suggesting, and I'm, like I said, I'm doing a broad, high-level design, not an implementation, is saying that we've got these eye beacons that are helping us on, the, on glass itself know where we are. And Glass itself has that map, has a map of what's around us, and is delivering us stuff directly from it based on our location. Last one I'm just going to touch on quickly since I know Katie is going to be pulling me off the stage any moment. Sorry, Katie is going to be pulling me off the stage any moment. Um, let's think about casual gaming. Any of you gamers here? Any of you develop games here? Okay, I'm quickly going to say that you should watch Timothy Jordan's presentation yesterday at the Game Developers Conference where you talked about developing problems in? What, what, he what he basically said, and what I'm going to suggest as well, is games where the user is staring off into space are a bad use of glass. Okay? But we still want those casual games, we still want networking games, we still want a game that people is going to play and return to. My, my book co-author, 
likes to bring this up any time, and he's willing to pay for somebody to, to write a Tomagotchi game for glass. A virtual, he wants a virtual pet on his glass that he can fiddle with every 15 minutes or so. And I promise that to him as soon as I get done with the book. So really quickly, let's cover these five points again because they are really, really important points. Make sure you design for glass. Think about things in terms of micro interactions. Your viewer is going to spend less than five seconds at a time on a good day. Don't get in the way. You should be supplementing the person's life, not replacing their life. Make sure you keep it relevant. And keep it relevant in both time and place. So if they're walking into a store, make sure it's relevant to where they're walking into. If it's the middle of the day, make it relevant to that. You may need to set configurations for all of these things, but that's the burden is on you. Avoid the unexpected. Glass needs to read our minds. And that's tricky, but we can do it because we're good software developers. And finally, build for people. Remember that glass is meant to live in our world. We are not meant to live in glass's world. Any more questions? This was a great question, by the way, that my next presenter asked the Google staff a, a few weeks back. And this is my answer. So a lot of what I've talked about seems like it's meant for just the mirror API, and you can throw all the rules out when you're building for the GDK. And that's not true. You need to keep all of this in mind for anything you develop for Glass. Any other questions? To what extent should you use the earphone and send audio messages rather than visual messages? That's actually a pretty good question. Um, I think it's going to depend on your app in a lot of cases. A lot of people don't use the earphone because it gets in the way of listening to the world around them. They can't hear the, uh, the bone conducting speaker so well. So when you're dealing with audible messages, keep your audible messages short and distinct. Same thing with what you're just showing on the display. Um, one of the, the things we talk about a lot for the display is making sure that what shows up there is distinct between other messages that may be showing up. So at a glance, or when you're talking about audible, at a very quick listen, you'll know if you want to find out more. Um, certainly, there are tools for reading things aloud, doing text-to-speech translations. Rely on them. Or you can use them, but don't rely on them any more than you should be relying on anything else that's come, that, that, that is part of uh, Glass. Anything else? So, so where do you draw the line between just being a high-level notification tray and being a Glass? <clears throat> I, that's, a, um, that's an interesting question. I think part of it depends on what you're going to be allowing the person to do in response to that notification. Um, it's also giving them the ability to launch things themselves. So we can launch things directly from the menu, currently with the, the voice commands of take a note or post an update. Um, those are certainly good entry points. And we know that more of them are going to be coming as well. When it comes to the notification cards as well, having the things like the reply option, having custom menu options, that's where I think we see the difference between a, a basic notify and something that's a little more advanced. And the fact that although I say five, five seconds at a time is a good rule, for, rule, rule of thumb, there are certainly going to be things that a user will choose to spend a little bit more time on, either reading aloud the text that uh, that is showing on the screen, or looking at that text a little bit more. And those are the things you need to at least be somewhat aware of. But at the same time, you need to be aware that they may consider it just too difficult to use on glass. So you need to give them the option to, to switch to a tablet or a phone as well. One of the things I really like about really well-designed glassware is it work, works both ways. It's not just the notification down. It's the, the sending things back and mirroring it on other devices at the same time. Glass is just one tool in that arsenal. Have you heard of Tasker and Autovoice? Because I can essentially do that if you sideload it on the glass. I have like 50 different custom voice triggers right now that can basically perform. Right. There, there are lots of voice triggers possible. Yeah. One of the biggest problems I have is that starts overloading with how much you, you can do and want to do. Um, and some of them aren't recognized very well. I have not played with those specifically. But we do know that Google is approving more voice commands as, as they come. 
So it's, it's coming. It's not there yet. We have to remember GDK is still in the early days, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, again, where to find me? Go to prisoner.com. It's got my links to Google+. It's got a link to a help out session that I run to help people get started. Uh, and if you post any of your developer questions on Stack Overflow, I'm one of the people who reads almost every single one of them. Thank you. Did you guys get some good new information you hadn't heard before? Yes? I hope so. Um, all right, so let's see here. So I see a lot of you are tweeting us, and that's awesome. So our remember our hashtag is Google Glass NYC. We got a lot of uh, comments before that we didn't mention Google Plus. So don't just tweet at us. Google Plus us. I guess that's how you say it, right? You can't say tweet. Post plus, Google just plus. plus. Plus us. Boom. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, plus us on uh, Google Plus. Same hashtag, Google Glass NYC. And uh, how many guys use Google Plus anyway? Can I see it? Woo! Yeah. All right. How many used it before they got glass? How many used it before you got glass? Okay. All right. Interesting. Yeah, I was on uh, Google Plus from the beginning. Who was here? From, who was on it from the beginning? Ooh, not bad. Cool. Who used cool. Google Buzz? What? Cool. <laughs> I told you it was Google Buzz. Buzz. <laughs> Buzz. All right. Cool. Wave. Wave. Anybody on Wave before? Uh, who misses Wave? I kind of miss Wave. It was kind of cool. Uh, so next up is RoboCop. I mean Zach. Sorry. <laughs> I look at twice. You look. You look crazy, yo. <laughs> crazy? Look that's crazy. awesome. Why do right. I look crazy? You know this presentation is going to be dope, oh, right? Oh, computer. <laughs> okay, let's see. I've got to change the resolution here so you guys can actually see what's going on. Hi, my name is Zach Friedman. Uh, I didn't... I, I, have a, I actually have a lot of them. Okay. Yeah, I realized I wasn't wearing enough technology. Do I need to turn this thing on or something? Yeah, yeah. No, good. <laughs> oh. Hi, hello, ladies, gentlemen, and cyborgs. My name is Zach Friedman. Uh, I started Void Star Lab, the mercenary hardware hacker agency. Uh, I am paid to do weird things with technology uh, for clients who have very interesting ideas. Uh, today I'm going to show you some really, uh, some, uh, just some stuff to get your head spinning. A uh, little bit about the future of technology, a little bit about uh, a little bit about the future of technology and a little bit about uh, kind of the future of wearable. Um, because I'm going to be using Google Glass to actually do my demo, um, I decided to wear, oh, I unplugged the wrong thing. I, I decided to wear uh, something slightly different. Uh, this is the system I'm wearing that isn't glass. It's Octagon version 5, which was the wearable computer that I wore before I got glass. And I should have probably started the timer um, should probably have started the timer uh, around the time I got up so that I can keep track of when my presentation ends. Awesome. Okay, so uh, let's, get, let's, get, let's get a little weird. Uh, one thing that's very important to know is that uh, Alan and I are like, the, the war, like, Alan and I are on opposite, really opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, the, the war between Team Shale and Team Cotton is nothing compared to the war against Team Mirror and Team GDK. And it's by the fact that I'm going to be connecting hardware to glass, uh, it should be pretty obvious which side I'm on. So I just came, so I just came back from San Francisco, the wearables DevCon, and I built this in front of the audience. Uh, this is a Nerf gun that connects to Google Glass. And uh, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, but um, I'm not a very good photographer, so I'm just going to give you a demo, and uh, then I'll pile on a bunch of words. So, without further ado, let's get let's get started. Uh, so I'm going to do a little screen casting. Uh, oops, wrong. Uh, there we go. ASM, my perf Android screen monitor my go-to uh, streaming system. Wait a second. Uh, the, that's not on my glass, is it? No. It is. How the hell did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> this is actually displayed on my glass. Oh, that's odd. I bet the devils lose. Uh, Happy birthday. 
Oh, is this guy in the audience? Is Luca Radici in the audience? I don't care. I don't care. I'm gonna I'm gonna start a video. We're gonna sing Happy Birthday. We have ten seconds to do it. Ready? Three, two, one. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Now for, some, now for the fun part. Uh, OK Glass, it's no for nothing. So as you can see, uh, can you see this clearly? Uh, there we go. Uh, frame rate's gonna be a little questionable, but this is a we're using low speed rendering here because we're boxes. Uh, so I've got this Arduino, whoops, on the side of my Nerf gun. It's connected to a couple sensors. One of them keeps track of one plunger goes back in this way. The other keeps track of what is inserted. Um, and using the magic of the glass development kit, we're gonna connect them. This is just standard Bluetooth, by the way. Let's see if this works or if I have to pair it again. Uh, this is just standard Bluetooth, which you can totally, yeah, there we go. You see, now it's connected and it knows that there's no magazine. Uh, so, let's stick one in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I haven't yet figured out the weak lock in a live current. So yes, this does work. And this is for all those, for all those jabs you're making against me, he's making it personal. Uh, this Nerf gun is connected to glass, and I can't for life me figure out how to keep glass on, so just bear with me. Uh, it's just using standard Bluetooth. This is, this is an Arduino Fio with uh, a roving RN42. I should ask, how many people have ever played with an Arduino here? Never thought you'd be asked that at a, gla at a glass. Uh, you guys, awesome. What are you, you traitor? Uh, never thought you'd be asked that at a, a glass meetup. Uh, you can use just standard Bluetooth 2.1 uh, to communicate with glass. Uh, now, there are some interesting parts of this. For those of you who are interested in using this, thing number one, you have to use secure symbol pairing. Uh, that's, you know, that's where it, uh, SSP, that's where it shows like, is this the same password on this device, on this device and that device? It's called SSP, you have to use it because on glass, you can't type in a password. On top of that, unlike a standard Bluetooth device, there is no U there is no UI in Glass to pair a Bluetooth device. So you have to do it from within the app itself. You have to initiate all the pairing, etc., uh, from within the app. And you also have to handle programmatically connecting and disconnecting. And uh, you're using Bluetooth 2.1. And I know what many of you are thinking. First off, why not use Bluetooth Low Energy? Well. Hopefully there's a Google person in here who can give us a time frame yeah. on when they'll expose API level, what is it, API level 16? Then? 19? BLE. The other thing is that it doesn't actually take as much power to use a Bluetooth device on Glass as you would think, because Glass already has a Bluetooth connection going all the time to your phone. This brings us to another point for those of you Glass developers. Uh, how many people here, we said before, how many people develop, how many people have developed Android apps, right? Okay, awesome. So you guys have a vested interest in having your app interact with Glass. Now the same way you can connect to an arbitrary device with Bluetooth, you can connect to the cell phone in a person's pocket with Bluetooth because it's already paired, you don't need to handle programmatic pairing. You can make an app that has a counterpart on Glass that you communicate without having to go onto the internet. Are you understanding what I'm saying here? You can make apps that like seamlessly work across devices. This brings me to the meat and potatoes of my talk today which is why I'm here right now. Why am I showing you, oh, did, it, did it work? Yeah, it worked. Why am I showing you a Nerf gun uh, that connects to glass? Because I'm talking about, I want to tell you a little bit about the future. You see, until very recently, we thought of each of our devices as kind of an island, right? You know, it had its own apps, it had its own functionality. What on earth just happened? It had its own apps, it had its own functionality, uh, it had its own internet connection. Things may work together, but they do it through the internet, through an API. Now we're moving into this world, you know, Android, you know, Android Wear, of course, really uh, brought this to people's attention. We're moving into this world where you have apps running on different devices that communicate with each other, but that's not the way it's going to end. In the future, it's going to be the very same app. The Nerf gun, the glass, the firmware, and the software are all part of the same app. The app is, is cross-device, cross-language, cross-UX, it's all the same functionality. 
this is how, if you really want to design into the future, this is how you should think of your apps. Don't think of how will I make a smartwatch app that plays well with a person's phone and with their glass. Ask them, how can I make an app that extends its functionality onto a smartwatch and onto glass and onto uh, their cell phone and onto the internet, why not? Uh, this is kind of the future uh, that I try as best I can to design towards, a future where it's not just what form factor do you want to run the software on, it's how can we run, how can we take the, the things that are best done by each form factor and make it happen. And on top of that, I really like to inspire people to make, oh, really like to inspire people to make crazy projects. Uh, it doesn't matter what you're into, there is a way to bring, uh, there is a way to bring win. Her, uh, hardware guys who have never developed software before, great intro project. You don't, your heart, your glassware can be hardware. Uh, I find that really cool. I've connect, the first thing I did, connected glass to my car. For, uh, this was after Cecilia got her ticket. I'm like, well, I'm make an app that could only be used in a car. <laughs> it actually works really well, by the way. It's really cool. Uh, you know, it's, I can keep, you know, whenever I look up or whenever I drive over the speed limit, it shows me my speed. And uh, I find that easier to keep both eyes on the road. But think about this. Think of like, how can you not just blur the lines between the device, between the devices you have, not just lower the boundaries. How can you make them all the same device? Uh, many, for, for many people, their development outlook on glass is, uh, you should, is like you should write apps, uh, the, way, the way Alan put it was, 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 very, was very well done. You should write apps that kind of uh, read the user's mind. I want to take it a little further. I want to write apps that become a part of the user. The, you know, it's not just a collection of random electronics that happen to be attached to you, they're extensions of you. And that's what, that's what got me into wearable and all that. Um, my, my goal here today is to kind of like give, just like, uh, you know, inception some ideas into, into you guys. Uh, give, I, I know, unfortunately, not too many people, um, not enough people are developing. I came back from the wearables dev con. It was so cool to see all those people who are actively developing for this. Sometimes all it takes is that right project to ignite that burning desire. And you know, no one wants to learn to code, let's be honest. No one likes learning anything. It's more fun to pick a project and then just run with it. Uh, it's, 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 you can bootstrap your way into learning stuff if you have a project that's pulling you through. Um, and for that, I have three things to say. Uh, first, the first is uh, the future of gaming uh, on glass is audio. Uh, so any of you who read R.L. Stein's Goosebumps Choose Your Own Adventure books back in the day, pour it to glass, it would be so cool. Thing two I want to say is, uh, this is a great pro- this is, I, I really enjoy doing this project, it's a lot of fun. And it actually works well, um, I'd love if more developers did this, and I can talk a little bit about the technical aspects if you guys are curious. The other thing is, I want to hear what you guys want to make, and I want to hear what you guys think others, others should make. I left an extra long time for, for questions here, because just really want to get this back and forth going. What happens when you do crazy stuff with wearable? And with that, I have a question back. I'm sorry for gesturing with a gun. It's forced to happen. It's actually it's about the gun. What sensors did you use to detect the magazine and so forth? What sensors? Did we, had, uh, we had the question was what sensors do we use to detect the magazine and the firing? These are read switches. These are magnetic. Uh, these are like magnetic sensors. And actually, let me plug this. Let me plug this guy back in so you can see what happens when I do this. Uh, let me plug this in, and let's start this up again. Uh, it continues to be no for nothing. When I remove the magazine, it knows when the mag's out. That's because I stuck a, a magnet on it. It has a read switch here that detects a magnet. And that prevents me from having to line up micro switches and other things. And there's also one back here, so that when the plunger tube retracts, glass doesn't always turn off, but it knows that a dart's been removed. Um, any, uh, who else, who else has something interesting? Otherwise, I'll ramble a little bit. Any questions? Any comments? Any, any anything? Nothing? I got something. I would love to see, like, because the display, the glass display has a lot of issues with light. And I feel like the mm. ever-changing lighting conditions, uh, it can't deal with that well. I think it's really hard to, to even see the display a lot of times, depending what room you're in. And it doesn't adjust. And I would love to see the ability to extend the screen, make it bigger if you need it to be bigger, and to use your hands to gesture instead of having to scroll painlessly, painfully, <laughs> to, to use your hands and to for glass to detect your hands as you are trying to manipulate what you want to see. So this is, so the suggestion was uh, like kind of extending glass. Um, if if I could put if I could push it a little further uh, to kind of like extrude itself into the real world to. Yeah. Uh, and I, 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 
Yeah, uh, make, make it uh, make it make it more responsive when you move from dark to light, and also not have to move up like this. I will hardly agree. Uh, a big part of a uh, big part of my philosophy on this is that it's not about the functionality and the controls. It's about what it's about intention. Uh, to that end, uh, I think it's very important that you're that is, if you're thinking through an app, make it very easy to move from the wearable onto another device. So if you try your glass, it's too bright out or something, you should immediately be able to pull out a phone and in an ideal world just unlock it and it's the same app that you were just using. Uh, that way you can drop down from one device to another depending on the functionality you need. On top of that, it's just like I was saying before, uh, you should be able to just slap on a pebble or something and instantly it controls glass. Uh, uh, any other crazy ideas for, for hacks? that people want to see especially. That's what I do on that. Yeah, tell me, say some more about hacking into the car and connecting to it. So we have a, we have a little bit of interest about uh, the car. Let me see, okay, glass show car dashboard. Do I have this one? No, I don't, unfortunately. Uh, so all cars manufactured, after, all cars sold after 1997 were required, uh, all cars manufactured after 1997 are required to have what's called OBD2, onboard diagnostics. And this is like a well-documented system. And if you have an OBD to Bluetooth adapter, right, it just basically allows you to run commands on your car's network. So you can pull out diagnostic information like, uh, oh, I'm wearing a love here. You can pull out diagnostic information such as, uh, uh, what's some stuff? Yeah, like how fast it's going, instantaneous miles per gallon, etc. Uh, there's an app for, uh, for Android called Torque. Uh, that is designed to connect to these things. I basically made a cover of it for Glass. It's actually on my GitHub, if you guys are curious. That's Zach Fried it's github.com slash Zach Friedman. It's called Voidstar Auto HUD. It's a little outdated. Uh, I, I, I need to update it for the newest, uh, newest GDK. You can do all kinds of stuff with this, by the way. Uh, there's a system called Automatic. Have, have you, ever, you, ever heard of, you ever heard of this thing? It plugs into your car's dashboard and uh, yeah, it plugs into your car's dashboard, and it, the biggest downside, number one, is Bluetooth low energy to connect to a phone, so obviously Glass can't do it. Number two is, you can only run queries on it with a web API, so think of how nuts that is, right? Your car is sending information to a dongle, which is sending information to your phone, which is sending it up to the cloud, which is sending it back down to your phone, which is sending it to Glass. I say cut it all the middle, man. Let's connect one directly to the other. Uh, you can get the, do the dongles are cheap, by the way. They're just called OBD dongles. Uh, Usually they have what's called the L327 chip, if you want to get real technical. And it's like they're super well documented and trivial to use. And you can, you, you know, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff with glass on it. Mm -hmm. To touch on what Matt was asking about, mm -hmm. if you go to Thingiverse.com, there is a actually 3D printable shade for glass that'll block uh, extraneous light. Okay. That brings light and it will actually let you see glass in one environment. Um, I can print it for you. That's cool. <laughs> it's interesting. This this wear this uh, this wearable that I uh, built for myself before I got glass. This is number five. Glass was number seven. Uh, this one is not transparent. It's black. I actually found it was pretty annoying. Uh, dynamic range issues and whatnot. Uh, the trick for a wearable, uh, the trick to making it be more visible outside is not to make the display is not to make the viewport darker. It's to make the display brighter. So I think. Google's actually done a fairly smart job of this. Uh, the flip side, of course, being it drains battery, but that's the price you pay for being superhuman. Uh, we, it looks like we have time for, uh, for one more question, so let's pick something particularly cool. Uh, anyone got a hack? Anyone got something interesting that they, that they want to share? Uh, I don't know how good the compass is. I know the, the GPS is not great. Uh, for, for, for the Galaxy S3, anyway. So I was thinking of an app when you walk down the street and you can look at a play and a building, for example, or an app, also use the angle, and you can say, find an apartment that's available in that building or in that floor, or get, you know, use the location, angle, and, uh, and the tilt. So the, suge so the suggestion was use some sensor fusion to find nearby, uh, nearby apartments. I have what I call the four glassmen of the apocalypse, which are like the wearable tech ideas that like ever that like just show up over and over and over again. Number four is firmly find me an apartment. Uh, I am for, for those of you who don't know me, I'm very much against augmented reality. Um, I don't think it. I, I think that there are better ways to do what augmented reality can do, uh, but situational awareness as an archetype is definitely a big one. 
if, if, for what it's worth, if, if, whenever people ask, whenever you get into that argument with someone, like, what can glass do that my smartwatch can't? Um, well, for one, interaction, uh, and for the second, uh, kind of a different paradigm. If you think about it, this is like a lens, right? Uh, it's like a lens, but I like to think of it more as a magic mirror. You know, you know how, like, the cell phone is like the black mirror? Well, glass is the magic mirror. As long as you're looking through it, you can expose hidden layers of information on top of things. And one of the things that many people want to see is, uh, one of the things that many people want to see is, of course, uh, you know, related to real estate and whatnot. Uh, the, the, the thing that this, but why stop at just real estate, right? There are localizable data sources all over the place. There are APIs, there are pub, there's public data, there's, or there's structured data, like that collected by the census and whatnot. Why should a developer have, why should someone, some human, have to write a new app every time you want a new source of data thrown in front of you? This is, the, this is what I'm thinking about. Back in the day, you know, when the internet was first thought up, Project Xanadu and all that, it wasn't like, you weren't stepping into someone's walled garden every time you wanted to get their information. The websites were kind of dynamically assembled. I think it's about time we return to that. Uh, if the information can be localized, expect it to do well on wearable. Uh, if the information is very t is time sensitive and critical, expect it to do better on a watch. Why? Because it's it's much it's much uh, it's much more natural to check a watch when you're talking to someone, but it's much more natural to look around than it is to. <laughs> this is what you need to think of. Uh, is Think, think beyond devices and apps. Think what would people want to do with their technology and help we mobilize whatever they happen to have on their possession to get it done. Thank you guys so much for <laughs>
I didn't really find much use of it. So I feel like meetups like this that encourage people to start thinking about what glass can do, how glass can be used, uh, is really important. Um, and also to encourage people wearing glass in the public as well. Um, I know it's been a lot of concern for some people. They're like, people are really staring, people are asking me questions. And it's more of a comfort thing. Um, I feel like with time, glass will definitely get a lot better and a lot more acceptable. It's just something that I feel uh, you guys are really, you know, being the word explorers, are going to push those boundaries of where glass is acceptable and what glass can do and where you want to take glass uh, and where you can wear glass. Um, I'm not a developer myself. Um, I do love the concept. I am learning uh, how to develop myself, so this is definitely something that uh, I'm getting a lot from as well. And I hope you guys can, uh, or have been gaming, getting as much as I have uh, so far. Um, some of the presentations before have been fantastic. I'm really not going to add anything to what um, has been said already. I think a lot of what um, our presenters have talked about are really driving home for uh, what Google Glass wants to be. I can't speak for Glass as a whole. I am just uh, one guy. But just from my understanding of what, where it's going and what it is, this is really, really cool. Um, so I'm really just here to answer some general questions um, that you guys have about becoming an explorer, about being an explorer, about uh, Google Glass in general. Um, anything I don't know, I will definitely tell you that I don't know. Awesome. So, question back there. <clears throat> so, I'm interested in um, glass in healthcare, and I was wondering, um, you know, what I'd like to do is to be able to see a patient using glass, but on a level that it's HIPAA compliant and it's encrypted. What kind of modalities is, are, are out there right now for for implementing this kind of thing in, in healthcare down the road? I mean, we saw the CIO of BI, um, yeah. you know, not that long ago. So, in terms of healthcare. Um, just off the bat, I don't want to say that Glass is, or Google is, as a company, is supporting any one method or use of Glass. So when Glass comes to healthcare, while we're very excited about it, we aren't really offering much in terms of, of development and support for it. We definitely feel like um, we're leaving this up to our developers to kind of come up with these ideas. Um, now, HIPAA is definitely something that's uh, very important to all of us. I've also worked in the healthcare field. Um, the pharmaceutical industry, and I know that HIPAA, you know, laws and violations are very serious. Um, you want your personal information to remain personal uh, and not have other people have access to it that don't need access to it. Um, but what I can say about that in terms of development, uh, there are a few doctors that have been using glass, and from what I've read and understood, is that a lot of the information is being kept within the medical field. So if you would trust your doctor to have your information, you'd also possibly sign a waiver. Uh, to be a patient of a doctor that has glass or is going to be using glass to examine your information. Um, I've had radiologists come by and ask, hey, can I push x-rays to glass? Um, how can I do that? And I'm like, well, it's really up to you to figure out. Unfortunately, I you know, really don't have uh, the tools or the ideas, and Google really isn't going to support that. But we are giving people the tools to develop things like that. So um, I, I can't give you a solid answer in terms of what data will help encrypt patient's information. And if the patient comes in with Google Glass, how they can then share that information with their doctor and make sure it's secure that only the doctor gets it. Um, but I think this is a perfect crowd, and this is a perfect room to kind of uh, poise that and you know let it out there. Um, definitely go on the Explore community, uh, post, post your questions there. Um, yeah, you just kind of take it from there, so I hope it helped. Um, I do interviews with my red carpet film fest. So, a couple, couple questions there, and I'll try to answer them as best I can. So, in terms of zooming and also the focal point of glass, um, glass is kind of set in terms of where it uh, focuses on. Um, there is no way to adjust your focal point or what you're actually focusing on through glass. So, um, the idea behind glass really is to just capture whatever is in front of you. Now, what you'll notice as you're using glass, do you do only compare glass? Or? Uh, not yet. Okay. I'm trying to decide. Awesome answer, not yet. Um, glass will actually shoot a little wider than what you're actually focusing on. So when you're taking photos and recording videos through glass, you'll notice that you capture quite a bit more, not too much more, but a bit more in terms of uh, how far wide right. glass will record. Now glass recorded is 720p HD, so you will be getting HD videos from glass. Glass also has 12 and a half gigs of usable storage for the user, so you can always load the videos, hit save them on glass, share them afterwards, plug them into your laptop or computer, download the photos from there. You'll also see the resolution on your computer as well. Um, now in terms of 
frame rate. I actually don't have that information as to the exact frame rate which Glass records. Um, I can definitely find out and get back to you uh, if that's something you really need to know. Um, but uh, pixel or the camera itself is a five megapixel camera on Glass. How serious is the Google team about improving the camera and the video? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't think that they are too concerned with improving it to something that's maybe an 8 or a 10 or a 13 with image stabilization and things like that. Um, not to say those things can't come. Again, like we've heard earlier, Glass is really just meant as a tool for you to kind of use in micro interactions. So if you want to stand at the red carpet and interview people and uh, capture these phenomenal moments, you'd want to use a professional camera. And that's probably going to be your best bet in terms of capturing those moments that you want. Now, if you have a one-on-one -on -one interview, maybe you're on the side with somebody or you're backstage, and you can take a photo as well uh, through Glass, uh, you can definitely use Glass for that situation. It's more intimate, more private uh, situation where you can capture audio, also capture video of that person. It's going to be in HD. You can take your photos quite easily, and you can also let the person know that, hey, I'm using Glass. You know, definitely make them aware of what you're going to be doing through Glass. I think that's important as well. The advantage of Glass is that when someone is talking to you, they're looking at the camera. Whereas any place else you do the when you have an interview with Glass, uh, not only in the U.S. around the world, um, he has some very interesting points as well as to how inconspicuous Glass can be in terms of getting those one-on-one -on -one interviews and how you know mobile it is versus carrying your camera moving around. And you're right, it is something that does help uh, allow the user to focus on you. I also heard from other journalists of people who are usually interviewing that they tend to find that wearing glass to record prevents the people you're interviewing from speaking like a machine or going on record. Uh, they tend to find that once you place a microphone down, people start talking to the microphone versus the, people, the person that's interviewing them. Um, so I feel like glass has an advantage that way where you can kind of forget glasses in the way and also just look at the person in the face and carry that conversation forward. Yeah, who did you mention? Uh, Tim Pool. Tim Pool. Uh, there's a question back there, yes? So, um, I hear what you're saying. Um, and okay, uh, do, do you want to ask me? Wanna maybe move in a little closer and just ask again. I'm sorry. Uh, I just want to. I don't want to repeat the wrong thing. Can you get a live feed essentially from your camera gear or equipment, possibly low resolution, to kind of uh, have your professional equipment somewhere and actually know exactly what you're shooting through glass and have a live feed of video from your equipment to glass? Um, from my experience, from quite a lot of glass, new. No. It's not something that glass is intended to do. While it is a cool idea, you then remember have, you, you also remember to have to tailor what you're trying to do through the specs of glass. There's a finite amount of battery on glass. Um, you don't want the display to be on for, again, more than just a few minutes or a few seconds of interaction. So to have that light feed, while it's not possible now, um, a lot of things that developers and Zach is able to do, you know, develop these hacks and kind of modifications around it, while fine, I don't think will make an official glass appearance um, in terms of just directly uh, mirroring what you see on your, on your video camera. In terms of loaning glass, um, we're still in our explorer phase. Uh, so being that YouTube Labs has those loaner equipment, um, it's definitely cool, and it would be really cool to see some of the first-person perspective videos of um, you know, people wearing glass and things like that. But I think once we reach that public point, um, we probably want to stay away from uh, loaning something that's really not ready for the public just yet. Uh, Zach? Uh, 
Um, and then what I need to know to develop for Glass. And I think this has already been discussed. If you're familiar with developing for Android, you shouldn't have to. Uh, you right at home, really, developing for Glass. Um, and all you really need to focus on is the design language and how it's going to appear to the user, and how easy it is for them to interact with these uh, items you're trying to share with them. Um, lastly, resources. Definitely use Explore Community. That's where myself and a lot of other Google employees go to get information about what you guys are using Glass for, how you're finding Glass, modifications, requests, things like that. So please keep up the chatter there. I know a lot of you are already using that. I recognize some faces, some names there. It's all great. Um, definitely go to developer.google.com slash Glass. Check out the Glass platform development policies. That will kind of also guide you in terms of what you need to know and how to develop Glassware. And as mentioned before as well, Stack Overflow is an excellent resource for developers to communicate and learn more about Glass. All right, um, as we're wrapping up, definitely please feel free to come approach me uh, if you're interested in getting glass. Um, you can have a one-on-one -on -one talk about the process, and I can definitely help you out there as well. All right, thank you. Thank you so much.
let's head over there and, and continue the fun. Let's also a uh, round of applause to Google for hosting tonight. Thank you guys for coming out.